as I said, everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name's B. I'm the Director of Customer Success here at Wazuku, and I'm joined by Abby, who's one of our sales engineers, who's going to be supporting me today. Um, so let's just share my screen and we can kick off. And get into presentation mode. Fantastic. So welcome, everyone. Um, if this is your first webinar with us today, a warm welcome. We run these weekly. And if you want to find out about more webinars that we do do, you can go to www.wazuku.com and you will see our webinars listed under our events. So we welcome everyone today, as I say, who's returning customers. A very happy new year to you all and anyone who's new. Um, so for today's webinar, we're going to just start off with a quick introduction, as we always do for our newcomers, about Wazuku and how we help our organizations innovate with both internal and external audiences. And then introduce you to how you can use the Wazuku platform and crowd to manage your sustainability program. So giving you a bit of a background, talking about some of the benefits, why organizations are doing it, and most importantly, how they're doing it as well as giving you some tips and tricks for actually how you can implement sustainable process to address some of the challenges we know you all face. Um, Abby will then be taking us through a demo actually showing you on the platform itself is how we recommend you run these challenges, the processes that we've tried and tested with our customers to be able to both crowdsource and understand the problems that they're facing, but also actually how to garner good solutions and use the crowd to really develop that. So we will be running probably for about half an hour and then we'll have room for questions at the end. Um, great. So starting, with, starting off, sorry, with a little bit about us. So we're Wazuku, we work with organizations globally, providing them with the tools and processes to be able to crowdsource ideas and more fully formed solutions from both an internal and external audience. So we are based on what we call a challenge-driven innovation method. So rather than just crowdsourcing every and any idea, what we look to do is work with organizations and provide them with the tools and processes to take an overarching program or goal, such as sustainability, and break those down into more actionable and manageable challenges, utilizing the crowd not only to capture those solutions, but to be able to help with the prioritization and development of those solutions and ensuring that there's full visibility throughout the organization to be able to take those challenges, report on them, and show insights so that we can make this truly repeatable, scalable, and create sustained value over time. So we are working, and our organizations are working with audiences all over the world. And those audiences, as I say, are anyone from in, inside that organization. So employees, but of course, post COVID-19, we're seeing that those employees are quite disparate as well, right through to suppliers and through to customers, ecosystem partners, and through our inattentive crowd, a wider world of problem solvers, students, academics, partner organizations to help find those solutions which aren't always available inside the organization itself. So bringing on to today's topic, which is really about sustainability. And of course, we're not the first people to be talking about this and actually even talking about crowdsourcing ideas to address corporate sustainability challenges. In fact, if I look back um, through our Open Innovation Challenge Center, we, of course, were running challenges on anything such as low cost rainwater storage in 2009. So we've got a long history of addressing these environmental and corporate sustainability issues, but we're not alone, actually. If you see early examples of companies like Unilever, there was the Sustainable Living Lab, which was set up in 2012. And there's been an abundance of different activities, events and crowdsourcing initiatives to actually get those solutions to these problems from outside the organization. So nothing new, really, in terms of what we see. But it's not to say that there haven't been shifts, and certainly in my tenure with Bazooku and looking at the history of, of, of this movement through research, 
we've actually seen that organizations are increasingly being a lot more public than they ever were about their priorities and their R&D activities in this area. So I think you'd be hard pressed now to go to a company website and not see a sustainability or a sustainability initiatives ban sort of as a link in their top banner. And a lot of information about what those goals and those problems areas are and actually how you can begin to address that. So really organizations unlike other initiatives are being very open, which makes it relatively easy for us to be able to help understand um, where we can help, but also for you as working in these organization as to what the goals and potential problem areas are. So that's a really good shift to be able to see that, see organizations being transparent and being able to collaborate with one another to address these problems. And of course, with these um, priorities, and as we see it become more front and center, the way in which organizations are designed to be able to cope with these challenges is of course changing as well. And a recent report that I was reading from Deloitte said that actually they're seeing shifts in the way in which sustainability departments are being created and being built into the organizations themselves. So around 50%, I think it was a survey of 70 financial organizations last year had a head of sustainability. But of that, only about 15% had a chief sustainability officer. And we're not just talking about, you know, chief sustainability officer as the, as the sort of single solution to organization problems. What we are seeing is actually the prevalence and the ability of that as a function to really touch other areas of the organization and not exist in a silo. But because of this, and like innovation programs that we often see, it still remains a relatively siloed department and is often at odds with operational ways of working. And so what we can see or have seen in practice is there might be and there is a absence of integrated sustainability and business objectives and often a strategy to be able to realize that. So you have, of course, these overarching programs. You've got someone or a small team who have been tasked to deliver these and then an entire infrastructure of an organization who aren't able to help deliver that. And so that's one of the areas that um, we want to talk about today and actually how these sustainability initiatives and problems can be solved by the entire organization rather than just left to a small or few individuals. And I'm going to thank our partners of ECHO. Um, I took the slide from you, but I thought it was it best encapsulates sort of the why now and why organizations are actually we're seeing more of running sustainability related challenges. And of course, it comes down to different pressures. We see increasing amounts of regulation, and we think that two weeks in the life cycle of a sustainability regulation is actually um, quite a long time. You can see that, for example, China can increase a pledge from you know 40 percent um, carbon emission reduction um, through to 65 in the course of a week. And actually, that pace of change means that the pace of change required to deliver against those objectives is actually putting quite a lot of pressure on organization. And of course, with the regulation, then comes the capital. So as we see organizations investing, it's going to become harder and harder to be able to get that investment and, of course, ensure that that brand or that organization continues to have a good reputation as buyers, as suppliers, we're often looking at that ecosystem and thinking about how interconnected supply chain is to customer, to different types of consumer, and those typical boundaries that we see are beginning to erode. So it's important to think about ecosystem, reputation, the pace of technical change, and of course, the market pressures themselves, ensuring that organizations have to meet an increasing amount of regulation in order to operate, in order to retain talent, to continue to work and continue to be competitive. So there's good risk, there's bad risk, but there's certainly an increasing amount of pressure, both from a competitive stance, regulatory, everything else, as well as the planet itself, of course. So organizations do need to act on this. And it's great to see that, as I said earlier, they are already doing that. And they're doing that in a really great and diverse manner of ways. So 
what we've seen a lot of, of course, is competitions. Um, this is often a good starting point for organizations who want to engage a crowd, particularly an internal crowd, around solving or addressing some of these problems. We've also seen supplier communities who are not just looking within the bounds of the organization itself, but thinking about how can we better understand our suppliers, ensure that that remains a um, sustainable network for us and begin to do some collaboration. And of course, the open R&D side. If you go to our Innocentive Challenge Center, what you'll see is an abundance of challenges looking from anything from early stage ideas to more fully formed concepts as R&D departments begin to think about how they can effectively buy in and capitalize on other people's knowledge and experience. And of course, engaging customers, again, to that point that these boundaries that we typically see are eroding, it's a great way, as brands are often doing, to be able to involve their customers through collaboration on the B2B side about in-contract sustainable delivery, right through to B2C and end customers. We're also seeing the use of the platform for more goal tracking, and often this is to do with visibility is as we see on websites sort of great pledges, people want to understand what's happening in real time and actually see ideas for a process of development, track the implementation of the various initiatives and be able to feel part of it and contribute to it. So that's often a core use of the platform within the um, sustainability agenda. And of course, on an incremental level. So we've always seen a lot of it. It's a great way, again, to get people really involved and in thinking about waste, repetition in existing ways of working. Again, allowing the organizations to really remain um, competitive, but also ensure that their crowds and their people are a really big part of it. And of course, this is a great starting point. But what we really try and recommend as much as possible is that we move away from this event-based approach, one-off competitions, single challenges to suppliers, to a more integrated and process-driven way of working so that we can address that problem that I alluded to earlier, that sustainability is an event-based um, solution, that it's a responsibility of single teams to ensuring it becomes part of the operating system and ways of working for organization, which is really where our challenge-driven challenge innovation process comes in. So what we're thinking about is taking our process of getting from goal right through to implemented ideas and ensuring that that process can be run throughout the organization in a routine way, not just to address challenges or problems as a one-time activity, but to continue to progress against that goal and of course retain it when we meet it. So these sustainability pledges, as we all know, it's not a sort of single end point. These are continuously coming up with new challenges and therefore we really need an approach which allows us to continually address it and utilize the capital both inside that organization and in the wider world to help solve some of these problems. So we really promote this as an approach, which is starting, of course, with the goal and opportunity. As I said, these goals and these opportunities are clearly stated in most of the websites that we see with businesses these days, allowing us to get a clear understanding and you a clear understanding of what those project programs are and what we're required to measure to allow us to hit that goal. But of course, saying how can we become more sustainable doesn't often yield ideas that we can do anything with because they might vary from a small waste re reduction idea right through to a completely new part of the business being spun up. So what we really need to do is break down that problem, those big goals and opportunities into specific challenges, challenges which are limited in scope, which can be acted upon which have the various support and sponsorship of the organization. So really ensuring that we can do something with the ideas which we're inviting our crowds to provide and actually integrate them into our ways of working. What we then do um, once we've defined those challenges is determine what the right channels for solving those problems are or addressing those opportunities and what's interesting with approach around this particular area and more so I think than any other area is actually how it's not a single individual or team within an organization. These challenges require 
pushing challenges and um, solutions from lots of different parts and lots of different audiences that might be known to you. So, of course, your, your employees and some partners, but also thinking about next generation, be it your students. It might be perspective people who might work from you. It might be even someone with a potential idea for a new business, but actually thinking how could we get that diversity of opinions to be able to ensure we can best address those challenges. Of course, the next step once you've determined who to launch that challenge to is to run it as a crowdsourcing initiative and begin to evaluate those solutions. And a really critical part here is again, thinking of evaluation as an integrated approach. So not a sustainability office, but actually thinking about different players in that organization and how they can come together to be able to argue and debate how to best implement that idea and therefore integrate it into ways of working and build and develop that into the organization itself. So this is our high level approach. And what I thought I'd do is just take an example. I actually just went on to Coca-Cola, thought it was a brand that we would all know and talk through how we could potentially take their example and run through this process. And as I said, the first thing I was to do was understanding what those goals and opportunity are. are. And it was very easy just clicking in and seeing, OK, these are the areas of focus and these are the specific goals. But some of those questions that we want to think about when we're addressing those programs is actually within an organization, who are the executives who are sponsoring it? Who is really the problem owners or who is the sort of problem owner singly? And why do they care about this beyond the legislation, but what's really the sponsorship of that particular goal or opportunity look like? And how does the specific program align with the overall business strategy? Now, when we're looking at implementing a new program, these are some of the scoping questions that we get a sense of to be able to inform how we then go about solving that problem, either through a single challenge, but typically through a succession of challenges. And what's important to measure? So taking these goals and saying, what are the metrics? What does good look like? But actually, how can we begin to step two, break these down? And again, just still saying on the top stage of the website, once there was the overarching programs, there was the priorities. So focusing on, on a specific priority and thinking, let's now narrow down into what specific challenges we might want to address in that area. So looking at a course of ESG is around diversity, equity and inclusion. And part of the sustainability agenda, what the organization wants to meet is to promote diversity inclusion and ensure that there's equal opportunity at all levels of the organization system and value chain. And this isn't about necessarily just reaching that point, it's around retaining that point as well. So some of the problems that might come up or something that organizations might want to address in that area, again, coming down to more specific challenges, might be how can we attract more diverse suppliers? How might we meet the needs of a remote workforce, both now in a post kind of COVID world or in a COVID world, but also into the future? And how can we not only keep these different um, diverse groups of people, but also from a um, supply chain from, from everywhere else, retain skilled workers. Because this is, again, it's about ensuring that we truly understand the problems and that we begin to address those. The third step in the process is around the audience itself. So as I mentioned, it's not just a single audience. There might be potential suppliers, employees, students, all manner of different audiences who are able to come in and address that problem. And it's not necessarily just taking a challenge and running it in isolation. What we're seeing more and more of is different organizations running challenges in parallel to different audiences, and then beginning to bring in that diversity of perspectives to be able to address those problems. So that leads us a bit about the process to actually how do you go about doing this on the Wazuki platform? I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Abby, who's going to take us through. Thanks, B, for that introduction. Uh, I will begin sharing my screen with you all now. OK. So welcome to the Wazoku platform. Today I'm going to walk you through um, an idealised setup of if you're starting to, pick up, to run a sustainability campaign, um, what that could look like on the platform, what setup we, we advise uh, and what success we've seen from other organisations. 
uh, I have created this internal community focusing on sustainability. And as you can see, there are two um, challenges in here active. Like B was saying, we're trying to take this from being an event driven capability to being something that's running consistently over time. And with that being said, we, we would advise having an ongoing problem capture challenge that is consistently capturing problems within um, your area of focus sustainability. For example, this challenge, which is prioritizing problems from uh, around the topic of diversity and inclusion, staying on the same theme as what B was talking about with Coca-Cola. Within the challenge like this, we would then recommend these four overarching stages, capturing the problems from the crowd first, shortlisting those, prioritizing it with um, senior stakeholders, evaluating which ones matter most, through to a token prioritization, and finally, a completed stage. A completed stage being, in, in this example, the problem statement being framed up as a challenge and running it to your sustainability crowd. I'll now walk you through what that looks like in more detail. In the capture stage, uh, we envisage you having quite a brief form, asking people to um, describe what problem they've, they've identified and why that problem is important to your organisation. Having a low barrier to entry and driving large engagement from your crowd as it's quite easy to engage in the challenge. Also, with it being public, people will be able to comment, like, vote, upvote this to, to show that this is a priority problem for more than just one person or more than just one individual in your organisation. After that, um, we envisit the shortlisting stage, having a, a, an evaluation criteria where you can uh, discuss the impact of the problem, rank its feasibility of being able to solve it, and whether or not this is a priority for your organisation. This evaluation can be done by the sustainability team, um, just to shortlist problems before you put it back out to the crowd. Following that, um, to, to, uh, problems which have been um, shortlisted by the sustainability team can then be put out for a token vote. This helps to democratise the process within your organisation, showing that you, you care what their priorities are as well, and that sustainability is more than just a sustainability uh, function. Everybody's input matters. People will be able to come into the problems that they really care about and grant tokens to say, this is the, the one that I think we should be running next. After this happens and you've uh, selected, which is that the top problem or currently the top problem as this would be an ever ongoing process with um, the top priorities changing and being run as challenges, you can then frame up that, that problem into what we call a challenge. This framed up problem statement beco um, becoming a fully framed challenge shows that you've got the goals clearly defined, that you understand what solutions would look like and you've set some, some gauge as to how a, a solution sh um, should be formed and you're also clear to the crowd as to the process by which the challenge will be run. A process that we recommend or a workflow that we recommend for these solutions is then an initial submission stage going through to a first review, which is a filtering by the, the team managing the challenge um, for viability. Finally, a second review by someone who has the authority to make the change and complete a stage where you're going off to get these ideas imp implemented and integrating them into your business as usual processes for implementation. The submission stage for this will again have quite a low um, low barrier to entry with a simple form. However, it needs to ensure it, can, it contains enough data points in order for an evaluator to make, a, make an evaluation decision. As before, end users will also be able to comment and vote, collaborating with one another to build out these concepts into more valid proposals. In the first review stage, um, the challenge team is then able to come in and in the evaluation stage, rank it against the criteria set for the challenge, prioritizing which solutions you want to see go forward. This will be the stage where most of the ideas are filtered out, only passing forward ideas that you really care about or that you really want to see um, implemented to the next stage of, of evaluation. The final stage of evaluation will be performed by a more senior member of the team or a senior stakeholder in the business, someone who is able to say whether or not this is a go or no go solution. The evaluation criteria here should be a very low barrier to entry as it's busy people within your organisations who need to quickly say whether or not you want to go ahead. After that happens, the ideas can move forward into your business as usual processes for implementation, being managed as a project or a um, tracked alternative in different locations. Okay, um, 
that's how we would uh, envisage uh, the sustainability campaign in an on ongoing fashion to happen on the Wazoku platform. Thanks, Abby. And no, Abby. Just a question on that. So how might organisations use metrics, for example, to be able to track um, ideas and solutions and be able to get that visibility? Yeah, so when you set up a challenge, you're able to, uh, if you go on to the solution-based challenge, uh, in the outcome settings tab, you can set your um, goals for the participation and the activity that you want to see um, through your campaign. This then um, sets your um, customized KPIs. Obviously, there's not much data in this challenge right now, um, but for um, your analytics tab, you can then start to benchmark between different challenges, what type of archetypes you're getting and what level of participation you're getting. Um, as this uh, changes over time, you can see which challenges are resonating well, and you can also start tracking against um, whether or not um, your comms are resonating with the crowd when you send them whether or not you're getting a good uptick in those. Fantastic. Thanks for that. Um, lovely. Okay. Thanks for that, Abby. Um, so just to, as we kind of draw to the end of this webinar and open up for questions, just a few final comments from me. So firstly is what can you do to be able to find out more about this? And firstly, we'd invite you to join a conversation with us. I'm looking to host a round table in February where you can learn from people and customers already doing this as well as industry experts on how you can actually put in place an innovation program based around sustainability we utilize our crowd and our technology to be able to harness an existing crowd. So please email me directly, be it with Zuku, to be considered for this roundtable. We've also got a lot of resources if it's something you are looking to find out more about. So visit the sustainability section of our website. Um, one of my team will be sharing the link in the chat. Um, as well as other resources we have around how existing and customers and other organizations are utilizing crowdsourcing. So first, I invite you to listen to Bayer Crop Science talking about how they're using open innovation and our customer Sandvik, who are sourcing ideas for employees as part of their sustainability agenda. So many thanks for that. And a final um, plug from me, but we have more of these webinars coming up. I'd love you all to join us next week for highlights from our product roadmap um, led by our Chief Product and Strategy Officer, Rosemary. And please sign up to future webinars where we will take you through, as we have done, an opportunity to find out more about how you can use Wazuku um, and how you can use it to next off address new products and services and improve existing ways of working. So, Now's the time for questions. So anyone have any questions for us? That's where you get silence, B. <laughs> I'm sure someone has a question. None? <laughs> I might call out someone. Ah, we've got someone actually coming through. There's some questions in the chat, but not specifically in the questions tab. I'll give people a minute. There'll be some brave person there, I'm sure. Uh, ah. Yeah, there's one there, B, on how do you manage innovation enthusiasm? <laughs> Thank you. So I think that's a, that's a key part of this as well is around incentives for people to um, participate in these programs. So of course, organisations with these increasingly um, increasing amounts of regulatory and, and of course natural pressure to to address some of these challenges around ensuring the right types of incentives. So it may be that to drive enthusiasm, it's also thinking about within and outside those organisations how can we align the right incentive schemes to people at different levels inside and outside that organization, be it the opportunity for partnership, it might be in early stage careers, the opportunity to shadow or work in different areas for senior exposure. And of course, 
from the partnership side is where's the co-collaboration and how can you partner with other brands? So part of this um, setup and planning of your campaign is in fact determining the right incentive structure. I believe we're doing a webinar that on incentives coming up, so we will keep you informed. Um, there's also another one in the chat, in the question section there, B, on how do you prepare for innovation antibodies? Ah, who exist across all organisations. So again, this is part of the, and I think this ties into what Steve just mentioned around ensuring there's continuity of ideas. And first and foremost is understanding who, where those barriers to the um, implementation or the actual capture of those ideas or solutions might be and actually ensuring that they form part of the process. So what we're often seeing is people who might be long into their careers or have been at the organisation a long time and might be tired of, of, of the changes and um, failure of organisations to implement solutions is actually forming part of the challenge design process. They might be early stage people that um, challenge managers or champions might want to involve. And again, ensuring that there's incentives for participation. One thing organizations I've seen do is they're very good at getting incentives right for people participating, but not necessarily being part of the evaluation of solutions, um, the implementation of solutions, um, the design of challenges. So again, ensuring, and we can share with you some more ways on how to, to bring those in. Are many organisations pushing sustainability onto their suppliers? Um, it's the next one, e.g. packaging, waste or plastics. So we've seen a number of supplier communities um, set up, and I think it's something that we, we're expecting and we're, we're promoting that we, we would see more of. People are typically working on a small number of suppliers rather than looking at the entire supply chain. So I think it's an area where we've seen more on the internal side than perhaps um, more on the supplier co-creation and collaboration side. But people certainly are, are moving in that direction. How do you make sure you're fo you focus the workforce on meaningful challenges? So I think the focus comes down to finding those meaningful challenges and ensuring that those are adequately promoted through the organization and they have the right level of sponsorship. So critical to, to all challenges, both in the launch during the campaign life cycle, be that continually or uh, for, a, for a period of time, is around getting that communication and messaging right, ensuring that you don't give people too long to be able to submit ideas and you're quite time focused with it and drive that, that focus that you want to see. Yeah, B, I think that also comes down to the workflow that we were just talking about with prioritising the problems. If you really try and democratise that process, bring everybody into it, um, arguably you're, you're um, making sure or validating that you are working on meaningful challenges. Mm -hmm. Do you focus only on challenges in the short term or do you offer sustainable open innovation solutions in the long term as well? So I think there's um, there's organisations doing both. There's more sort of if we're thinking longer term as in far reaching goals, there's some organisations who are focusing and looking very far out solutions. And again, that comes down to what's the best audience to be able to address that, as I as I showed earlier that there's going to be different audiences to address near term problems. Those might be more smaller term, short term changes that might be through your existing employees, whereas longer term changes which make time might require input from, as I say, be it prospective employees, be it small businesses who might become a big supplier in the future to be able to harness that and, and get the, the right input from all crowds. Um, is there a volume of initiatives past which you cross into the overkill territory, um, e.g. more than five campaigns and you dilute in interest? So I think talking about challenge fatigue, there be. Yeah. So so with this, and it's again dependent on, on, on different audiences. So what we see is that if there's more specific challenges that might be run to to different audiences then you you continue to have that diversity and that breadth if for example it seems that there's a new challenge every day which is applicable to everyone in the organization it doesn't allow for that focus so it might be that you choose three or four kind of organization-wide um, campaigns in a certain amount of time and then might more 
might address more localized problems. Again, making those visible for different audiences to contribute to, but actually ensuring that there isn't that challenge fatigue. Yeah, I think a lot of these come back to the balance, if I'm honest, B, getting the balance mm -hmm. between long and short term problems and also getting the balance about which audience you're, you're focusing on at any different time. I think uh, planning out a good challenge pipeline is something that you're often working on in the with the, the customer success team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And getting that pipeline and, and being, you know, as you say, sort of open to it and understanding that things might change, but actually giving your audience visibility. They know what the goals are and they know what the programs are, but what that challenge pipeline might look like. Fantastic. There's uh, no more at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic. Okay. Um, well, I'm um, available. My, my email address being shared, as I say, we'd love to invite you to participate in roundtables and reach out if you have any questions. For me, um, my team or Wazuka around actually how you can implement this, once you have implemented it, how you can make it more successful over time. Ah, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, great, everyone. Well, thanks very much for your time today. A recording of this will be available um, along with the slides we presented and templates on how you can use this um, and start running sustainability challenges today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.